Okay, it's seven o'clock. I'll uh, call a regular meeting of Buckhand City Council order. Ask that you join me in a moment of silence, please. Thank you. We'll respect the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Don't see any Wesleyan students. Is this young man over here? Are you a Wesleyan student? No. <laughs> uh, we have Dennis Alexander uh, with just beneath the service alliance uh, to make a presentation. Dennis, for you. Sure. I'm going to try to go through this quickly. A lot of you have seen this, but um, I, basically what the, the point of this is, is just beneath the surface is a group that was started originally by IOGA, Independent Organ Association <laughs> of West Virginia, but it's really grown. We've got a lot of support from other industries in West Virginia, the West Virginia Manufacturers Association and several of them. The whole point is there's so much misinformation and disinformation about the oil and gas industry that we've started this, this outreach to do that. And while we're doing a lot of advertising, we found that advertising is nowhere near as meaningful as doing one-on-one -on -one presentations like this where we have a chance to interface with people and let them uh, ask us questions and go through the whole thing. So. These are the just beneath the surface um, supporting partners, and you can see that we've got people like the Chemical Alliance Zone, the Polymer Alliance Zone, the West Virginia Business Roundtable, and these people are actually out here giving this same basic PowerPoint that I'm giving you this evening. Um, so let's start out and talk about the Marcellus Shale that you hear so much about. What is it and where is it? This is a map of all the shale plays in, West, in, in the United States, and it all started down here with the Barnett Shale in Texas, which is right there. And then it moved out into the Haynesville and the Fayetteville and some of these smaller shales. And you can look at the size of that. That's about 5,000 square miles. This monster up here in the northeast, that is the Marcellus Shale, which is 95,000 square miles. So you can get some idea of the magnitude of it. Here's a, a closer up map that shows where it is in relation to West Virginia. The entire state has pretty much has uh, uh, Marcellus Shale under it, although some of it's not thick enough and some of it's too close to the surface to ever be productive, but we have Marcellus Shale in pretty much the whole state. You can see here's a thickness map. Upshur County's right there, and as you know, we've got some pretty good wells in the southern part of Upshur County. The other areas that are good are up here in Tyler and Wetzel and Ohio County and Wood County. Um, so we're, we're right, in a, right in a good spot in Upshur County. Uh, lately you've been hearing a lot about the Utica Shale. The Utica Shale's deeper than the Marcellus. Over here in, in Ohio, there's about a 2,000 foot separation between those two shales. But as you go east, the Marcellus dips deeper, and I mean, the, the Utica dips deeper and the Marcellus stays flat. So if you get over in this area, there may be four or 5,000 feet difference between the Utica and the Marcellus. But <coughs> this light green outline here is the Marcellus. You can see that the Utica is even larger than the Marcellus, although it's deeper and it has some, some drilling challenges as far as being able to drill horizontally at that depth. Marcellus Shale may be the second largest uh, gas field in the world. There's $757 million in yearly salaries paid to people working in the Marcellus Shale right now. At least 7,000 new jobs have been created in the last three or four years since we've started developing the Marcellus. And as you can imagine, every time we have more jobs, that means less social cost in terms of unemployment and welfare and those types of things. The average annual oil and gas salary in West Virginia right now is over $60,000. So these are good, solid jobs. Most of them come with 401ks and retirements and health insurance and that sort of thing. We have 35,000 people in the oil and gas industry right now in West Virginia. We're expecting one bill, even with these pr depressed prices, natural gas prices have dropped from $14 peak in the summer of 2008 to $2 today. But because people are betting for the future, they're looking at a billion dollars in new capital in West Virginia just in 2012. So that's, more, that's all drilling dollars. There's also billions, literally billions, that have been in the last couple of years and are being invested in new pipelines and processing equipment uh, to, uh, to fractionate gas, to separate the gases and that sort of thing. One thing people don't realize is we pay 5% of our gross income goes to the state of West Virginia off the top. 
So, you know, no other industry pays anything like that. And you as a city council know how much grief you get when you try to level you a 1%, but 5% off the top goes to the state. And we pay county ad valorem taxes, which are, they vary because of levy rates and things, but it turns out to be about 2% of our gross. So to, to kind of put it all together for you, over $500 million in tax has been paid to the state of West Virginia in the last three years because of the increase in oil and gas revenue. Um, the estimates are saying that even with these lower prices, we're looking at about $350 million annually by 2015, based on all this additional drilling. Um, people don't understand why these gas prices have fallen so much, and let, I, I try to explain it this way. The wells that we traditionally drilled in Upshur County, the Benson and Alexander wells, 5,000 feet deep, when, when I would prospect and look for places to drill those wells, I was looking for a place that I thought I might reasonably recover 150 million feet of gas. That's 150,000 MCF. If I could find a place like that with the decline curves we have around here, I would get my money back in three to five years, and over the 25-year life of the well, I'd get maybe three times my money. A lot of times you didn't get that, sometimes you got more. But these horizontal Marcellus wells, they're doing four to five million a day which means in some cases in 30 days, those wells are making what our wells did in 25 or 30 years. That's how much gas is out there now, and that's simple supply and demand, why the price has gone from $14 to nothing. Cabot's got two wells in Susquehanna County that are each producing 30 million a day, so in five days, those wells made what my wells around here would do in 30 years. I'm just trying to give you some idea of how to, how to get your arms around the size of it. A lot of you heard about cracking, um, but I want to explain that real quickly. Natural gas is comprised of several different gases, and ethane, butane, propane, very, very several different kinds of gases. One of the gases that we commonly find in our gas stream is ethane. Ethane can be separated through the processing plants from the rest of the gas, and that ethane can then be put in a, through a steam cracker, and that that process yields ethylene at the end of the day. And the ethylene is the primary feedstocks in the plastics industry. Years ago, when we had Hastings Compressor Station, we used to strip off ethane and send it by pipeline to Institute, where West Virginia had the first steam cracker in the nation. And that's one of the things that fed Charleston's very, very active um, chemical industry years ago. As we moved east and got into drier gas, that, was, that, that, that plant all broke down and that, that cracker's been going for a long time. But there is an abundant cheap supply of ethylene in West Virginia, and that could revolutionize not only West Virginia's economy, but the economy of the surrounding states and the nation. It's a, it's a huge opportunity. Um, many of you know Karen Facemeyer. She's a West Virginia senator, and she's also president of the West Virginia Polymer Alliance. Here's what she said. According to the American Chemical Council, a 25% increase in the supply of ethylene, the predicted amount of supply, uh, growth in supply given the Marcellus shale boom, could result in 17,000 new chemical industry jobs, 395,000 jobs outside the industry, 16 billion in chemical industry uh, capital investment, 4 billion in federal, state, and local revenue. Now, let's suppose Karen's wrong by a magnitude of five. <laughs> that is still an impressive uh, potential. Um, and it's happening now. Many of you have read about the, the first uh, preliminary sighting of a, of a crackering plant is going to be up in Manakin, Pennsylvania, 10 miles over the line uh, in Beaver County. Although, you know, a rising tide floats all boat, we will benefit from that. And there's still opportunities to build additional cracking facilities here, and that's, that's being looked at. Well, having said all that and ta told you about the economics of all this, I think it's important that we try to convince you that this, this whole process is safe. All these economic benefits aren't worth a whole lot if, if the hydraulic fracturing or, or the production of the gas is not safe. So I usually go through a whole drilling process, but I'm not going to do that tonight. If any of you want more information, I'll be happy to do it to you. But when we drill these wells, we set at least three strings of casing when we drill these wells, and each of those strings of casing is cemented in. Um, in order for, for for anything to happen from that frack job that would get into 7,500 feet deep, to get into your water zones at two or 300 feet deep, you would have to have a breach of three strings of steel casing and three sheets of cement. But moreover, when you go to frack that well, if your casing or your cement doesn't hold, you can't fracture the well because that frack's gonna take the path of least resistance, gonna come right back up on the surface. So we test before we frack, we test the pipe and cement, and we know that there's no failure before we frack. So 
we're pumping that stuff down at 7,500 feet. There is just no way it gets into your water table. Um, this is just a diagram that shows you the casing of the things. That I'll give you more detail later. The other thing that's happening now is we're, we're now drilling, instead of drilling wells every 1,000 or 1,500 feet, we're now drilling from these big pads. And we have the ability to go horizontally. Uh, to Intero Resources in Harrison County has been out 10,000 feet, 9,868 feet. We've got one planned for 10,000 feet in Pennsylvania this year. So if you can drill multiple wells, each going 10,000 feet out from one pad, Range Resources got wells in uh, in Washington County right now. They got 18 wells on one pad. So if you figure 18 wells each going two miles in different directions, that's a phenomenal area that you can drain from one five to eight acre pad with one road and one pipeline. And being able to drill horizontally lets you access some areas that you couldn't otherwise do if you had to drill vertically due to due to cultural things. If there's a lake or there's a or there's a wetland or there's a building or something, you can, you can set up nearby and go underneath those things. Um, this is just an, an idea right there. You can't really see that very well. That little square there, that shows you what we would drain if we drilled a vertical well. We would, drill that, we would drain that little area right there. With a horizontal well, we can drain that entire block. And of course, that's a three to 4,000 foot thing. This slide was done before we got out in the eight and 10,000 range, but they're going eight and 10,000 feet routinely right now. Um, this is a this is an original prospect we put together in Pennsylvania. This is Interstate 79. Washington County is right here. This is our first layout. You can see from one, two, maybe three pads, we were going to drain that block right there. It's about a thousand acres. Um, since that time, we've picked up additional acreage, and now it looks like that. That's what we're working on right now. That that last slide you saw is encompassed in there. So, in terms of environmental footprint and what we use look at this if you're going to do I'm sorry if you're going to look at horizontal wells if you're going to drill 11 drain 1100 acres with horizontal you can put one pad in that's about five acres so you disturb five acres with one pipeline and one road to drain that same area using vertical wells the conventional way we did it you'd have to drill <laughs> 55 wells and even if each one of those well sites is only one acre that's 55 acres, plus you've got to have 55 pipelines of 55 roads, and each one of them take up surface. So it's a much more effective, efficient way to develop our resources. This is a Marcellus location down in southern Upshur County, down near the Horseshoe Curve. That This is one of the early ones that Chesapeake drilled. And um, this, this waste pit here that you see, you won't see those anymore. Everything is done in a closed loop, and there, there is nothing that goes into a waste pit. This is a supply water pit, that's clean water. But these waste pits are gone now. Everything gets put into tanks and hauled off. This is that same location after it was reclaimed. There's a there's a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. So you can see that, when, that, yeah, it's somewhat of a mess during the operation, but when you're done, you know, that that's that pad can, can host several wells. So to recap. Hydraulic fracturing is the technique. People confuse drilling and fracking. Drilling and fracking are two different things. But hydraulic fracturing is the technology we use to stimulate the flow of, of gas out of, the, out of the tight zones. It was first commercially employed in the 40s. The wells lined with multiple strings of steel casing cemented into place. The bulk of what we're pumping down that, that well is fresh water, 99.5% fresh water. We use some chemicals in there to make the water slick. Um, most of it's guar gel, that sort of thing. There's never been a documented instance of water contamination caused by hydraulic fracturing, contra contrary to what you read and hear and see. There's never been an instance of that. Um, you can't really <coughs> see this, but if anybody has any questions about this, I can provide you with this slide better. But this basically, most of what you're seeing in this 0.5% of additives are things that you would find around your household. I mean, most of these things like guar, guar is what they use to slick the water up and reduce the friction. It's the same thing they use in ice cream to make it thick. You know, when you hand crank ice cream and you can't ever get to set up, put a little guar in it and you do that. And there's, there's some very mild acids that you would use around your house. There's nothing here that's terribly nasty. Uh, and all this stuff is now public. There's a, uh, there's a website where you can look at every gas well and see exactly what they pumped in the frack job. The other big misconception is how much water do we use? And think of it this way. When they're going to frack a well, you see these water trucks up and down, up and down, up and down the road. Well, what would it be like if you didn't have a water pipeline to your house and every day when you needed water, you had to have water trucks haul it to your house? 
it'd be a lot more visible. But in, in reality, take a look at this. This is the amount of water used in, this is Pennsylvania, this is the state of Pennsylvania. That's the amount of water used daily for power generation in Pennsylvania. That's how much industrial source is used. Well, if you look at power plants and industrial sites, they're usually sited along rivers. And you don't see water trucks hauling to them because they got a pipe out in the middle of the river and a pump running 24-7, and they're pulling a bunch of water out. You just don't see water trucks, so you don't recognize it. This is how much your public water systems, like Buchanan's you know, public service district does. This is other. That's how much Marcella shale drilling takes up. And you say, well, how can that be? All we hear about is how much water we're going to have. Well, those are the facts, and this is based on the fact that this water is all pumped right out of the rivers. Um, State of Maryland has sued uh, oil and gas operators in Pennsylvania claiming that they're taking water out of Pennsylvania that won't get down through the Chesapeake Bay. Susan Nobleski, who's the head of the Susquehanna River Basin Commission, says, Susquehanna River provides Chesapeake Bay with 18 million gallons of fresh water every minute, and they're 1,440 minutes of the day. The SRBC estimates that if the natural gas industry was at its peak, <coughs> with all the companies active, they'd use two minutes of water a day. So we are not going to use all your water. And we're also looking for ways to reduce our water consumption anyway because it's very expensive for us to not only bring the water in but to store it and then to dispose of it. So if nothing, if for no other reason, we're doing it for cost-cutting purposes. There's also no proof that ground that fracturing has ever caused groundwater contamination. Scott Perry is the head of the Pennsylvania DEP, and he says after a million experiments across the country, and what he's referring to is there's been over 1.2 million wells fracked in the U.S., I've yet to see a single impact of fracking actually directly communicating with freshwater resources. Again and again and again, I've never seen a single instance of fracking cause direct communication we keep hearing about. Then there's Lisa Jackson, who is no friend of our industry. I mean, she's the head of the EPA. This is a May 24th congressional testimony. I'm not aware of any proven case where fracturing process itself has affected water. And then just last Thursday, in no case have we made a definitive determination that fr fracking processes cause chemical contamination of groundwater. And i got to tell you, if the, Ob if the Obama administration could hang us out there, they would have done it. And then you might have seen this in the news last week. This is a quote from a guy that was the head of the EPA. He was the EPA administrator for Region 6, which is Texas. And here's what he said on tape. <clears throat> it was kind of like how the Romans used to conquer the little villages of the Mediterranean. They'd go into a little Turkish town somewhere, they'd find the first five guys they saw and they would crucify them. And then, you know, that town was really easy to manage in the next few years. That's our general philosophy. This guy has now resigned as of uh, a couple days ago. But this is, the, this is the mindset that we're dealing with from the EPA. They want to find the first five guys and Lord knows it could be me. <clears throat> and that's the attitude we have. Um, in final closing, I talked about the chemicals we use in the water. This is a game I like to play at the end of my little presentation. And it's called, What is this stuff anyway? This is a list of ingredients to something that you would find in your household. And it's nasty looking stuff. Hoard hydrofluorocarbide 152 and all this stuff. You know what that is? How about this stuff? This is really nasty looking stuff. You know, and you get down to this one, and you say, well, that's no nastier than the other stuff that we're seeing. That's your frack water. So just because it has nasty sounding names doesn't mean it's all that bad. So. What were the two things? Pardon me? What were the two things you were showing up there? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, hand soap was one of them, and deodorant was the other. But if you, Dave, if you read the, the, the stuff in there, it's benzo, I can't even pronounce the stuff. It's, you know, nasty sounding, multisyllabic names. but. At any rate, um, that's my presentation, and um, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. The thing, the message I want to take, we want you to take away from this is, what we're doing is safe. It, it it has a huge impact economically. We're grateful to the city of Buchanan, who's been very gracious. Unlike some of these municipalities that have tried to ban fracking and run us out of business, and you know, I I, I just anytime we can get a chance to come before a group like you and tell our story is, we're happy to do it. So thank you. Any questions for Dennis? I have two questions, Dennis. Sure. Um, I have an oil and gas background. What is used to hold the frack open once it's fracked? Is used there some sand or sand? A okay. we, we use we use auto sand, and now there's some experimenting. There's some experiment going on with with glass beads. <coughs> They're trying to do that. But what, what what he's referring to is when you when you fracture these wells, what you do is you pump, you go down the hole and you perforate. You shoot a hole in the pipe at the place you want to fracture. And then using just hydraulic pressure, you pump six, seven, eight thousand pounds until you physically fracture open 
that formation. When you, now you start pumping and try to establish your rate. But when you stop pumping, it heals itself. So what Scott's talking about is we use what's called a proppet. Just like if you dig a coal mine, you dig so far and you cut a prop and you put it in there to hold the roof from falling in, we prop open that formation. Now we're only talking about fractions of an inch. But the way you do it is you start putting sand in your water and you fill that fracture up with sand-laden water. Now when you let the pressure off, the sand props that formation open. And we use Ottawa sand primarily, although they are experimenting with some, with some synthetic uh, glass beads or plastic beads. We might, we might be able to recycle our glass with these. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, North Buck Canada, <clears throat> some sand solids in, right. And, and my last question, with all the trucks out there, is not necessarily my concern about the water usage. It's the weight of the trucks on the roads that weren't originally, perhaps, designed to take that weight, continuous wear. There is an issue out there that the industry has to address and cooperatively with the county and the state. Have, the, 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 that's being addressed. If you go in a lot of these places now, to get it, when the new permitting bill, we now have to go out with the, before we can get a permit issue, we have to have a waiver or a, a sign-off from the state highway department. They go out and look at all the roads, they set the bonds, the bonds are paid. In a lot of cases, what they're finding was the roads are substandard anyway, like Chesapeake and Gas Star and these companies, they're spending tens of millions of dollars redoing these wells before they start. Now, that's not happening here now, but mostly up in Marshall and those places. But I think if you go in Southern Upshire County, you'll find a lot of people who tell you that their roads are better now than they ever were. After the fact. After the fact. After the fact. Now, what they, what they're, in the past, what they did was they went in and tore them up and then fixed them later. Now they're finding it's economic for them to actually put a good base in and fix them before they go in and then just clean them up when they leave. But. I have a question. Mm -hmm. the, the pictures you showed in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, you said that you trucked out the water, the bad water. Is it bad water? Well. The, wa no, the, wa the water that, after we get done fracking, you get some of that water back. And, and what happens with that water is one of three things. Um, it's, it's, it's usually uh, filtered and reused on the next well, sometimes stored on site until they do the next well, or, or it can be hauled to another location for, where you have other wells. Or um, you have to haul it to an approved disposal site. Most of those are, uh, are old injection wells and they're mostly in Ohio. So you do one of the three things. You either uh, store it on site for reuse, or you use it in another well nearby. I did a well in Barber County this past year, and I hauled the well over to Tucker County, and they used it over. And, but, and all that stuff, you have to, from the time the water comes on your location, there's a manifest for it, and you've got to account for every barrel. I mean, just like a chain of evidence in a, in a legal proceeding, you have to account for every barrel of water. I have a question. Sir. Uh, what about the stories we hear about uh, industry-induced earthquakes from fracking? Well, there's a, I'm glad you asked that question. There, that's, a, that's a misconception. There, there is potentially some earthquakes that are happening around wells, but it's not the result of fracturing. What's happening is some of these shallower wells, not Marcellus or, or Utica, some of these shallower, older wells, once, they've, once they're no longer productive, they turn those into disposal wells where they pump water, wastewater from various industries back down these wells. It's the, it's the wastewater being pumped into these shallow wells that they are suspecting of causing some um, earthquake activity. That's the theory, and it's, and it's possible. In some places, like on the San Andreas Fault, they actually pump water selectively in these old wells to try to prevent earthquakes. So, I mean, there is a link there, but, um, but, but the, the problem is people confuse water and fracking with water disposal. But to the extent that there is a problem with earth, earthquakes, it's, it's more likely related to disposal of wells from old wells that have been there for 100 years, not fracturing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dennis, I have a question. Yes, sir. With the 80% uh, drop in the price for natural gas over the last four years, is there any rumblings in the legislature to increase your tax on gross? <laughs> if they want to put us totally out of business, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I don't know that they're, they're going to keep their 5%. I mean, 5% of $2 is a lot less than 5% of $10. But, but what's happening is there's so much that we've added so many dollars in volume. One of the taxes I didn't put up there, we pay 4.7 cents per MCF, not a percentage, 4.7 cents per MCF that goes to retire the unfunded liability for the workers' comp. 
we've been doing that since Governor Manchin took office the first time. And um, those revenues are up considerably. Uh, so it just proves that I'm um, like by 40 or 50 percent. So the reason that our revenues are staying the same, even despite the fact that the price has been cut two or three times, is our volumes have increased that much. Our volumes are just, like I say, these wells that make in, they make in 10, 20 days what our wells made in their lifetime, our volumes are huge. That's the only thing that's sustaining the tax revenues right now. How, how much does a Marcellus well cost to actually Well, it depend, depends on how long your lateral is, but, but start about six to seven million dollars and go up. Depend, the, the, the longer you go on that lateral and the more stages you frack, each one of those frack, jobs, frack stages could be four hundred thousand dollars. You do 20 stages in a job, you get $800,000, $8 million in a frack bill. Locations cost more. It cost them more to build one of those locations now than I spent to drill, frack, and pipe on a well. Dennis, there's a question behind you, I think. What do you do with the, or, uh, the horizontal wells? They people get money out of that, but you went through the lands. Yes, ma'am. And they, they do what they call unitizing. And in other words, if they form a unit that's, say, 500 acres, and you have, you have 50 acres in the 500 acres, you get 10% of the royalty. And somebody else might have 100 acres, they get one-fifth of the royalty. And that's all, that's all done up front. Anybody else? Dennis, thank you. Well, thank very, you. Very Appreciate very the opportunity. You, you always put a little different spin on it. I think that's the third time I've heard that. It's, uh, <laughs> well, Rich, that twice. Hey, Rich, do I hit this middle button? <laughs> One more time. Put a plug in for the... Uh, Double click. The I Omega show that, that's coming in. There you go. Dennis, I'm sorry, sorry, put a plug in for the, the gas and oil. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's... Thank you, Dave. I'm glad you mentioned that. Oil and gas equipment show will be here in Buchanan for the fifth consecutive year. Um, Last year we had about 300 exhibitors, and it was a big deal. And uh, um, it was a, it was a very well attended. It's a good show. Public is welcome to attend that for free. Uh, the other people that come, they pay 75 bucks, but they get some meals included. But if you want to come and walk around, look at the equipment, look at the exhibits, I think they set up July the 18th, and the actual show is July the 19th. Um, so you know, we'd love to have people come up and look around and ask questions. Where is it held? In? Uh, West Virginia Wesleyan College. It used to be at the Loop, but it's, it's where now? Well, since the Loop's gone, it's now over behind the library, between the library and the gym. But the, the exhibits will be in the gym. And then the outdoor exhibits, the actual rigs and equipment and things that they bring will be behind the library from, from the men, what I call the men's door, the quadrangle down by Doney Hall all the way back up to uh, the library. Okay. Uh, Kevin? Life. Yes. Your turn. Um, Mr. Mayor and members of the, the council, I uh, sent in two correspondences requesting one, uh, requesting um, the use uh, for free of charge uh, meter parking along South Kanoa Street and the uh, city parking lot there across from the Kanoa Lounge. Uh, we have luckily been blessed to have several veterans show up for our veterans uh, honor guard detail uh, to go and pay last respects for the veterans who have passed. Uh, we, between the VFW and American Legion, have about seven parking spots available. We've been getting about 15 to 20 veterans uh, attending the funerals, um, and each one is needed. Um, we're requesting for probably no more than two to three hours per funeral, uh, and we do on average about 60 funerals a year. The use of the meter parking and the parking uh, spots across from the canal lounge free of charge during the time frames that we have funerals. Uh, I'd like to develop a little four by six placard we can place on, on our dashboards uh, indicating that we're attending a veteran's funeral. Uh, and that would greatly help us out with, uh, with uh, the parking situation that we face right now. It's, uh, it's to the point where it's unsafe around those two establishments uh, during the week of, uh, or during the time of a, a veteran's funeral. And the second correspondence I've sent in is a request to, uh, uh, we've established a window, a desired window to place flags on veterans graves over the Memorial Day period. With the observed holiday being Monday and the actual Memorial Day being Thursday, we'd like to set the um, flags out to Thursday before uh, the 28th and keep them in place until Tuesday 
uh, after the 31st, which is the actual Memorial Day. And just I, I thank you all for considering those two requests. Uh, I think you all have, maybe we'll just take that up while he's here to answer questions if you have no problem with that. Yeah, there's two letters. There are two letters. One is for the uh, parking and the other is for the cemetery. And uh, let me ask you if I can I ask a question? Please. Uh, it, will that those dates interfere with mowing? I mean, obviously, it's with the flag job. Can it take the flags back up at the end? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. How did you know? How we've, does that interfere? Can we've it? actually wrote that into the, the cemetery mowing contract this year. Uh, the the contractor will windows. work with us okay. uh, around those dates to keep from uh, mowing down the flags. <laughs> Other than that, I don't see so the parking operation. could take it up and consolidate it? Well, I think it, it could, but it maybe we could recommend to them a consolidate reports to council if an if a issue like this comes here. I think we, we are, uh, it's appropriate for us to consider it. The, um, some of those uh, vets don't get around real good in these Correct. days. And uh, they need to have a bit closer access to the veterans uh, uh, hall there. And um, this seems to me would be appropriate for us to uh, to uh, act on this. Uh, if, if I'll make a motion. If someone's uncomfortable with, with doing this now, uh, I guess we could lay this over a meeting. But um, Dave made a motion to approve. The parking and the cemetery? Yes. I'll second it. Motion is made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? On, on the parking, we ought to get Matt Gregory involved in his office in the, in the parking. Well, I think the, uh, the <coughs> parking meter attendant certainly should be a Should be involved in that. How many again are we talking about, Kevin? Oh. I'm, I'm thinking of the most eight to ten parking spots. Uh, and it may, sometimes it might be four, sometimes it might be 11. It, Really, we're to the point where a lot of times it depends on the weather how many folks we get out. Ready for the question? All in favor, signify so saying aye. 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 No. Yeah, it's happening. Kevin, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Rick Wright. Indicated he likes to Rick. Yes, Mr. Mayor. I'm here with the citizens on College Avenue and Tucker Street. To see if the, what the update is on the building coming down. Okay, well, we we met with uh, Mr. Tenney again. He called me and asked me to um, come to a county commission meeting it was a Thursday a week ago. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. I mean, yeah, and. Um, yeah, he, I won't go into all the details, but he agreed before the commission, as he agreed before us, to uh, get his license renewed and so that he could proceed on uh, removing that asbestos and getting a building down. The earliest he could get into a class was May the 1st, which was Monday. And, uh, We'll follow up with him and see if he's in fact done that. But he promised us that he was going to proceed. And um, that's all I can tell you right now. So do you know if he's in that class? I haven't found out yet. Because last meeting you said you would check and make sure that yeah. he was in that class. I'll check. He'll be back before Randy. So we'll, we'll find out about that. When I went to work this morning, I went down by and there was he moved that old hoe back in. I have a tree with some kind of equipment. I don't know if it's a tree on the corner or a large bush on the corner. Yeah, there's, there's the old hoe that he had there before. So he's he's planning to get something going. Apparently, he's been in the class. Well, apparently, he doesn't get. I understand. I understand. Yeah, we need to know. You know, this is it's, this is very difficult on. for all of us to know what was going on. Every time we thought we knew what was going on, something changes. Uh, Jay, will you check in the morning to see if he's... I will check. And just, you know, to, to advise everybody, 
about the process, even though he gets his certificate and stuff and, and passes, hopefully, you know, it may take two to three weeks before the state grants him his license to begin. Now, they may be able to fax it up, they may be able to electronically transmit it and say you can go to work tomorrow, but normally there's a processing time before they'll actually issue the, the license to remove the asbestos. So, I mean, there may be a little, you know, period where nothing's happening, even after he's passed the test. But I'll check. Okay. I've got another question. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. Because you stated in the paper, I believe, that even if he gets the asbestos out, that Mr. Stell has in his deed of trust that he is Mr. Tenney until it's paid for, he cannot tear it down. Has that been resolved? Uh, now, Rick, I, I may have said something like it, but I don't recall. I think that the person who was saying that was, was uh, Mr. Tenney. Mr. Tenney was, is the one who's saying that uh, there's a provision in the uh, sales agreement or in the deed of trust that he can't tear the building down until he's paid for it. Now that's between Mr. Tenney and the previous owner, Mr. Stell. I, What's the, city, the city's uh, stand on this though? If that's the case, we're still in the same place we were three years ago. I've read the deed of trust. Uh, I can't tell you because it's been several months. Yeah. I don't believe there's anything in the deed of trust that makes that agreement. Now, the deed of trust and the and the uh, transfer of the deed are on record at the court. Sure. You can go get them. Uh, he said, uh, to my best of my recollection at the county courthouse meeting, that his agreement with uh, Bob Stell was that he would not be able to tear it down until he had paid for it. That but paper that paper. that was his implication. I don't. I have never seen anything in writing. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But to best of my knowledge, I have not seen. What's your all stand if that does exist? What are we going to do next? Let's get the asbestos out of that, and then we'll take another look at it. We'll see. Three more years? No. No. I I can't give you, Connie. I can't tell you when this is going to resolve itself. But I. I'm pretty sure it's not going to be another three years. Well, you, you there, do remember one one thing we tend to forget is the the uh, housing enforcement board brought Bob Stell when Bob Stell owned the property in and said the building needed to come down <clears throat> and he needed to take action on it. His action was to sell it to somebody else. Then so, we brought Cracker in. Yeah, we go through I mean, the whole process again. Yeah. We've been around this several times. And, and we talked we talk one time, David, if I can remember anything anymore, I, I think we indicated that we ought to take a look at maybe a declaratory judgment at some point in time. Well, I, there, I think we have some other avenues but if, but if Cracker does now and continues to do what he says he's going to do, and I can't, I can't again put a time frame on it, it would be great if they'd hand him his license at the end of the class and say go, and he'd be in there Monday morning and start. But as Jay points out, and Jay Holland, the city engineer, is a certified asbestos inspector and asbestos manager. He will not license to remove. <laughs> he doesn't want any part of that. But... Um, but Jay uh, knows more about this asbestos thing than probably anybody else in the room. And, um, and he worked with the school system and had those asbestos issues. So, so he, he, he knows and uh, he provided me with a lot of information about how this uh, uh, licensing process would proceed and uh, when uh, time frames were. I got that information from Jay. He, he knew how to obtain that. So uh, I know you're frustrated. You got to believe I'm as frustrated. I know it's not in my neighborhood, but it frustrates me that we've been chasing this thing for three years. That building was set in your neighborhood. Would you enjoy it? Setting absolutely down? not. I can. I better totally have been down already. already. Absolutely not. I, would I better not have been be down happy. already if it was in your neighborhood. I would not be happy. No, I don't think it would have. Because we'd have had to do the same thing if it was next door to me as we as we, as we have done that. Well, one of the neighbors told Sharon the other day that there was kids throwing rocks busting windows out of the building. Last so Thursday. How good your little fence over the door did keep well, the kids away, that, that was good. 
Well, I'm, 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 we're, we're really disgusted. Yeah. I'm sorry. I Bill. understand. Believe me, I did. Well, let me let me interject again, like I did two weeks ago and maybe four weeks ago too. I think we need to have this as a pivotal point for the city to take a look. I said it a couple weeks ago. There's a fine line between us being viewed as being intrusion versus really helping out the citizens and the residents of the city when they have something that you know is either is endangerment to the children or other people or deteriorates their property values and obviously what we have is not working now because we've been dealing with this for years and i know kenny i know how frustrated you are and so forth but i think we need to take this issue and learn from it and develop something that's going to be better for us in the future because you know there are things that will come up in the future that we may be frustrated again but there's got to be a better way of doing it and david you mentioned the talking to the legislature and getting them to do some changes and, and what they're working out as far as the deed of trust and so forth but i think we have to do something in the future and, and do it and do it on a timely basis i think it's sit down and learn and learn from this i think it's sit down with delegate hamilton and perhaps uh, requesting that he uh during the next legislative session introduce something to elevate the municipal lien status um, as it stands right now just to reiterate what i have told you a couple of times <clears throat> there is no priority given to a municipal raising lien that is to say the deed of trust that mr stell enjoys for that thirteen thousand dollars would defeat anything that we would put on record uh, that lien is superior to any lien that we would take the only lien that can defeat his deed of trust lien is the annual West Virginia real estate tax lien. That trumps everything else. But any lien that we would take is inferior to that deed of trust. So that's, if we could get the legislature to not only give us the lien opportunity, but to give us superior lien positioning, uh, that'd be a great thing. Well, I think, I think we need to ask Mr. Hamilton to come to one of our meetings. And I think we ought to get the municipal league to get involved in this whole process. Let me also mention, the mayor started to allude to this, and I want to just get back to what you were pointing out. And uh, the estimated cost to do the whole thing, to do the asbestos abatement as well as the raising, mm -hmm. was in the neighborhood of $20,000. Actually, twenty-five. So, dollars so the, the overwhelming majority, $20,000-plus of that cost, is associated with the asbestos abatement. That's something that has not been particularly palatable to the city because the city could invest this 20, 25,000 bucks. Uh, Mr. Stell gets the property back as he declares a, uh, a default under the terms of the deed of trust and the city's lien is just gone. We have no recourse except to go sue Mr. Tenney individually. And as we've uh, conjectured based upon his assertions with us in the past, it, it, it's it, he's judgment proof there's nothing to go after to to try to get that money back if it comes down to a cost of three four thousand dollars that the city may be on the hook for that's something that the council would have to make a decision about but it's something that you all might say you know what if we've reached that point that we've abated the asbestos and all it takes now is to make this problem go away is to invest that three or four thousand dollars that might be a decision that you all would entertain. There's a big difference between three thousand dollars and twenty-five thousand dollars. So that's that's something that you can take up. Uh, again, I think you, you give Mr. Tenney this next couple of weeks to see if he can comply, and if not, then you've got some additional recourse uh, to make this happen uh, in the next month. What, Connie? Well, I would like to know about the uh, seven different fines that were. Um, against Mr. Tenney at $100 each fine per day, which is $700 per day. By tonight, that would be $19,300. He has, he can't pay his fines. Well, you know, if we get a speeding ticket, we may have $2 in our pocketbook, but I'll guarantee you, we'd have to pay it. Somehow we'd have to pay it. It is not fair for one citizen to be get treated one way and another citizen to be treated another way. You take his resources away from him and that building will never go down. You know, it's just, it, it well, just doesn't take happen. It down. That's right. We can take you it, we can, we, can, we can throw away $25,000. Right. You've gotten $25,000 in property taxes mm -hmm. from me. 
in the last 22 years, and in 22 years ago, that building was falling down. The gutters fell off of it, and my husband called Mr. Stell, picked up the gutters, put them against the building. Every time he mowed, he had to move them for a year. Then following year, he put them in the dumpster because he had never come to even remove from our property. So, you know, you're saying that although all of us and some of our neighbors couldn't be here tonight that had planned on being, we've owned property there for years. So, um, you saying that, that Mr. Tenney can't pay his fines, so therefore there's no reason to fine him. You need to set an example. What would you do if your child did something and, well, he didn't have the money to pay for it, so are you going to bail him out all the time? That doesn't, uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense to the citizens who are paying their taxes. Well, I, I don't know how to answer you. I, I, well, I think you're talking about two different things here, but... but uh, I don't think I am. But, but we, uh, you know, we currently have another plan to get this building taken care of, and we'll see how it goes. If it doesn't well, go, Davidson, then we'll... In all due respect, we'll you've had many plans for three and a half That's years. That's right. We've had many And plans. I don't mean to be disrespectful <coughs> to you or to the council, but I really feel at this point that you've been disrespectful to us. That's, Sorry you feel well, I do feel that way. I do feel that way. Well, you know, one of the things that, uh, and I, I've been doing this for a long time, unfortunately, but um, I dealt with another party in another part of town. Uh, I didn't want to commit uh, city assets to take that down as well. But it, it actually took about five years before that process finished. I'm not saying right or wrong, but it took five years to accomplish that process. I had a situation the other day on another street, much much minor, just needs the yard mode. That's all it needed. But the house has been foreclosed. And uh, there's a phone number on the front door. So I called the phone number. It's a place in Texas. It's a company that manages foreclosures for business. I had to fax them a written notice that the grass needed to be mowed before they would take care of it. I mean, one of the things that I have an issue with is responsibility. If somebody would have owned up to their responsibility from the very beginning, moving the gutters, taking care of the building, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have this issue. I, I I think I'd like to do more as a city, but I don't have a budget to tear down buildings. Uh, I wish I did, uh, because I, I think we need something like that. One of the things that's possible in this community is to put a tax on every vacant piece of every vacant structure and develop a fund over time. And when you had a situation like this, I would have a line item in a budget someplace that would say, go tear that down. Do the asbestos removal, tear it down. That, that requires cash. It, it really does. You gotta pay somebody to do it. Um, it you know, people say, well, if they don't mow the lawn, they can just send the city in to do it. Well, that, that takes money. I don't have a budget to even pay somebody. Now, in absolute worst case, I might go do it myself. But I think the issue that bothers me more from this side of the table is the fact that people tend not to be responsible for their own property. Whether it's cleaning it up, whether it's mowing it, whether it's tearing it down, putting a new roof on it, or whatever it happens to be. And that's the sad issue. And, and I, really, I really hate to spend uh, taxpayer money to make up for somebody's lack of responsibility. That's more than what we're talking about here, but it's it's part of the, that process, which I find kind of sad. Oh, but you've got one person playing your system, and um, the no, majority. No, I don't have one person. I can't tell you the number. Well, I sent out three I'm letters. In this situation, I sent out three person. letters this morning for people that are not responsible for care of their property. 
Why can't the and I do that about every day that the seven hundred dollars per day that isn't being placed on Mr. Tenney be put against that lien? The property will not assess for nineteen thousand three hundred dollars. So if that money is tacked on to the, the amount of money that it takes to tear that building down, then the city is still going to get paid something. Because before he can get take over the uh, property, even if it's $15,000, we have to pay part of that back. Uh, I understand, uh, Mr. McCauley, is that all disappears when the deed of trust is trapped. The fines don't disappear. They wouldn't disappear for us. Well, if you couldn't <coughs> sue somebody, you know, how many how many times have you heard of uh, somebody taking a neighbor or a business partner or somebody to, to the magistrate court and they get a settlement? Court orders you'll pay this person or this person's to pay you $2,000, and they don't have it. They don't pay it, and they don't pay it. You take them back to magistrate court, and the magistrate said you got to pay them $2,000. Dave, speak to that a little bit. Well, there is a difference between the lien situation that I took up a little bit ago. No, I'm talking about the fine. fines. Yeah. Not fine. Yeah. But, but generally speaking, our Supreme Court of Appeals, and Jake Rigger or Judge Cagle could tell us better, uh, if somebody can't pay their fine, uh, you, there could be a contempt order. You could put that person in jail, but there is you, you can't squeeze blood out of a turnip. If, if the person doesn't have the resources, it, 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 your alternative is is go to contempt and put them in jail, and uh, you know we've we've had this discussion over the past six weeks in particular. Uh, do we take action because Mr. Tenney can't pay his cost of doing business in this respect and put him in jail, um, or do we see if we finally have his attention that in a relatively short period of time, a matter of weeks, that we're going to realize what everyone's goal is, that is to have the people who are responsible <coughs> take the building down. That's where we are. So uh, three years, building was built about 1920, 90 years, however long it's been a nuisance. If this is a matter of this uh, thing going away it, by the end of May, which we believe there's opportunity for that to occur, it's that's the way that's the way we want to go. But no one can tell us if he's even taking the class. We'll no one we'll, knows. We'll report to you. Let me ask. Well, we were supposed to get a letter. We were told from one of the council men members before that we would get a letter. I'd ask for a letter to be sent to the property owner. We didn't get any. We didn't letter. receive any of that. We're just left in the blind. You now you guys are elected officials. There's laws on the books. You know, it, it's crazy not to hold to withhold. Do the what the law says. No, we just said we can find the individual. Okay. They have no resources to pay the fine. Assuming they, they don't, we then put that person in jail, then go through that process again, and, and again, the city will not get any benefit out of that at all. The fine portion of it still doesn't get the building taken down. We can find them every day for the next six months and so go through what that process. When someone gets hurt in that building. Even if the asbestos is out of there, which we were told three different times that it would be out after that cease and desist order, cease and desist order, it would be out by that weekend uh, that the EPA had written a waiver to the city and it would be out in a matter of two or three days. Then it was the next week. Then it was um, when spring break, when the children were out of school. Nothing's been done yet. Oh. And there's kids in there all the time. It, the, the roof's going to fall or it's going to catch on fire. And it's too late. It, it will be too late when a child gets hurt. Now, I know all of you agree with me with that, but you're the city council. It's in city limits. You guys need to make a stand. We've done everything possible that we can do. We've tried to be patient. Three and a half years we've been working on this. Let me ask a hypothetical question, David. If, let's, let's assume that Mr. Tenney removes the asbestos, gets a class and removes it. The, uh, and the city would decide to go ahead and take the building down, 
What position does Mr. Stell have in regard to the city at that point? He still could proceed with a uh, declaration of default and a foreclosure and reacquire the property at a sale, trustee sale of the property at the courthouse steps. And at that juncture, again, the city's inferior lien is gone. It just disappears. Does the city have any liability once you take that building? The city has no liability whatsoever for that property. There's even, a case that came out took, of the Supreme Court even involving... Even if we took it down? I'm sorry? Even if we took it down? Well, we well, 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 if you... If we took it down, there wouldn't be anything to give rise to the liability. But if something happens to someone on that property right now, that property is not owned by the city of Buckhannon. The matter has been decided twice by the state Supreme Court of Appeals that as a result of a city not uh, requiring someone to tear down a property that otherwise should be raised, there is no resulting liability to the city. There's all kinds of immunity statutes out there that prevent uh, someone who would be hurt from saying the city's going to be liable. That's not to say that Mr. Tenney wouldn't be liable. But once again, we're back to someone that appears to be judgment proof. If someone would be hurt on that property right now, the titled owner is Mr. Tenney. Uh, it's the same thing if I don't uh, you know, take care of the ice and snow on the sidewalk leading up to my house and the mailman slips and falls and breaks his back. Uh, he can sue me for all the money in the world, but if I don't have all the money in the world, that judgment isn't worth the paper that it's written on. But if, if the city puts a lien on that property because of what we would undertake as far as expense, right. can we put a lien on his other properties that he owns, if he has any? If we were to get a judgment against Mr. Tenney, which is different from asserting the statutory lien on that property, if we were to sue him for a specific sum of money, then that judgment would attach to all property that he owns. But again, I, 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 we, we've done some abstracting relative to property interest, relative to liens that are out there, and from an equity perspective, it does not appear as though Mr. Tenney has any equity in any properties that he owns. That is to say, his collective debt exceeds the value of his properties. Mr. McCauley, I'm confused. Who owns the Dagon piece of property? As I have said on a number of times, a number of occasions, Carl Tenney is the titled owner of the property. Okay, if he's got all these fines, can the city not do what's called eminent domain, just go and take, take over that property? Well, eminent domain, we would have to establish that the property is going to be used for a public purpose. And there's no public purpose involved with just saying you want a particular property uh, structure to be raised. But even if it's a hazard and danger to the, the community? Eminent domain would not avail us of that opportunity. And Mr. Stell would be the first one to sue us and, and claim that his uh, security interest in that property was being violated arbitrarily by the city of Buckhannon. But if Mr. Tenney's the owner, what's Mr. Stell got to do with it? Mr. Stell has a secured interest in that property. It's like if I decide I want to burn my house down tonight, First Community Bank might have some objection to that because they're holding a $125,000 mortgage on my property. So I can't, we, we couldn't do that. It's, 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 the same, it's the same kind of principle. Well, I'll make two suggestions. One, based on Rich said, what Rich said, that we need to develop a process so that we can have a fund at some point in time for the future to take care of these kind of scenarios. And, and two, we need to uh, make sure that we as a council are going to stay on top of this. And I think we need to get a timetable as to when we want this whole thing resolved in a positive way. Now, maybe that's hard to do, but, you know, as Connie and Rick have said, that this is thing, this thing has been out there for a long time. It has been there for a long time. And it's dry, it drives me personally nuts. Um, it's just, you know, it's not right. And I think as elected officials, we do have a responsibility to come up with a system that's going to be better for all of our residents. And, and, you know, there's a big difference between cutting your grass versus having a building that's like this. And there ought to be a delineation between what we can do with some situations versus others. And I think. You know, maybe someday we need to have a town town hall meeting to talk about this kind of stuff and get more people involved in, in what we're putting together for the future. I'd ask, 
I know it's the last meeting for June the 1st. Some kind of action's got to be done by June the 1st. And I, there was no specification of what's going to happen June 1st, but we need some kind of uh, reaction from him by June 1st. But without having a consequence after June right. 1st, having that deadline out there is again like pushing a rope. I mean, right. we are we are absolutely stuck. I, I'd say next week. But uh, the one one thing I might suggest is uh, it's my understanding. <laughs> I have not been in the building for some time, but uh, it's my understanding that a substantial portion of the asbestos has already been removed. Might be good to go back and get another estimate. <laughs> The abandoned ordinance statute that went into effect uh, just over a year ago, the state of West Virginia passed this opportunity for municipalities to adopt this. We have been looking at it. There is a draft coming soon. Um, you have to be reasonable in what you can. I, I don't want to leave. I don't want the council to, to think that. Well, that's the answer. Again, this would be a fee that is imposed that you have to collect <laughs> again from somebody that doesn't have the resources to pay it. Now, that's not the only structure like that in the city of Buckhannon. There might be 20, there might be 50, there might be 100 structures like that. The fee has to be reasonable. Now, what is reasonable? Might it be $10 a month per structure? Maybe, maybe we could justify that much. Uh, but the point is, is it, it, you're not going to realize a huge cache of funds that are going to be available to do a $25,000 fix like this one requires or at least required um, as a result of putting that ordinance into place. It would take years in order for us to realize the funds that that ordinance would generate in order to be able to tear down one structure like this one. Hopefully most of them don't have asbestos in them like this one does. Uh, but it is very costly to remove a structure these days with asbestos. We deal with that up at the college all the time. Uh, you might get a really good deal on a piece of property uh, one of these quarter acre lots and you, you get it for 20,000 bucks and then you find out it's going to take that another $20,000 to tear it down. Uh, it's, it's, that's what the state and federal government have done to us relative to this asbestos stuff. We don't want to set a precedence to start tearing down buildings, the city paying for them, and other property owners just saying we're not going to do it. But that's we also don't want to set a precedence of not enforcing people to take care of their properties. Yep. So we're kind of... Mr. Queen, you're, you're dead on. And I don't want to lose sight of that fact. I have mentioned this to the council on a number of occasions. If the city was to go in there tonight and say, by God, we're going to work overnight on this project. We could have that place down by morning. I'll help, you know. And at what cost? 20, 25,000 bucks? The next person that is in this situation that needs to have a structure taken down and the asbestos abated I would be the first in line if I had a property like that, say, okay, I want mine now. Government, unlike private players, cannot be arbitrary. You cannot be capricious. You have to treat everybody alike relative to this process. And once you establish a precedent where you're going to alleviate somebody else's nuisance as it is, you're stuck with that. Yeah. It, it's, it, that's the danger. Uh, now, there is one recourse available to the neighbors that's not been explored, and that is they can go after Mr. Tenney and Mr. Stell. There is a tort known as a private nuisance action that the neighbors could go after someone engaging in the nuisance behavior right beside them. Um, I mean, I understand that you're looking toward the city to take care of your problem, and I think that is going to happen here in the next few weeks. Uh, but if, if, if the time frame that the city has implemented up to this point is not satisfactory, there is civil recourse via private nuisance action that those neighbors could take against uh, Mr. Tenney. There's also a writ of mandamus, too. Yeah. Is there not, Mr. McCauley? A writ of mandamus against, who would you assert that against? It would be against the city and the city council. You could, you could sue the city. Um, I, I assess our position as a plaintiff or defendant every time that litigation comes up. And you know, our position is a sound one to defend against us as a city being required to expend $25,000 to abate that nuisance. Uh, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't ever relish representing the city in any action in which the city is a defendant. 
but the city would come from a position of great legal strength if that kind of action would be asserted against us. Well, I would think we'd have a lot of strength too. We've been trying to do this for three years and nothing's been done. If you have another recourse available to you that you haven't explored, which is an action against Mr. Tenney directly, and we would tell the court that since you haven't exhausted that private remedy, you don't have a governmental remedy to pursue yet. So that's 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 the that's where that's the gist of that. Again, I, I think my, my sense is from everything that we've heard tonight and in, during the past two weeks, if we give this matter that's been perplexing to everybody for years on end another few weeks, my gut tells me that this problem will be take, taken care of about the first of January. And we'll, we'll find out from either Mr. Tenney or the instructor himself uh, whether Mr. Tenney was in the class, whether he successfully completed the class. Jay has his contacts. We'll, yeah, you know, we'll uh, get some information. It's the one in Morgantown. It didn't start until Tuesday. It would be over tomorrow. You know, so probably wouldn't know anything until uh, Monday at the earliest. But if it started Monday, class is over today, I would know something tomorrow. It depends on whether they started the 30th or the 1st. And, and we'll, we'll find out about Mr. Uh, Tenney, and we'll, we'll get information to you. I've got another question for Mr. Pauly. Does a lien not travel with the chain of title? Meaning the, the if, lien, if, if, the you lien put a lien, if you put a lien on this property, is Mr. Tenney's right now. Right. Mr. Tell forecl Mr. Uh, Stell forecloses on the property. The lien travels with the chain of title. It would go back to Mr. Stell. Is that not correct? No, that's not correct. Mr. Stell has a what is called in the law a first and best lien on this property. If action is taken to satisfy that lien as a result of a combination default being declared, as he could do but hasn't done, and a foreclosure that is an instruction to the trustee to sell that property, when that trustee sells that property, that second lien, or a third lien, or a fourth lien, those subsequent liens are all discharged as a result of that sale. They, there is no further lien on that property. The first lien prevails, all of, the, all of the inferior liens are defeated. Think of it this way. Let's say that I, I go to bank number one to buy my house, and it's a $100,000 house and I borrow $50,000. Now I want to put on a deck in the backyard. And I go back to bank one and they say, well, we're not loaning any more money right now. So I go to bank two and I borrow another $15,000 to put a, a deck on. And they take a second deed of trust. And now what happens? I, 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 I don't pay my first mortgage. But we're not talking deeds of trust. We're not talking it's, second It's the same deed thing. It's the same thing. Lean priority. It's the a, same thing. A mechanics thing. lien does not travel <coughs> with the, with the uh, chain of title. A mechanics lien is not superior to a mortgage deed of trust absolutely not i'm not saying i'm saying but it does does it not travel with the chain of title if i think i think that the chain of title through my real estate classes and my real estate license my understanding in the state of west virginia a lien travels with chain of title well it doesn't make a difference if 10 different people it goes dun, 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 dun. With all, the lien is still there with all due respect mr Wright, i've been practicing law for almost 30 years and real estate is one of my primary areas that inferior lien is discharged if there is a sale under a superior lien the, the second or third or fourth lien whatever it is whether it's a deed of trust whether it's a judgment lien whatever it is that is defeated by action on that superior lien it, there wouldn't be anything left of that lien relative to that property. It just, it's, it's discharged, it's gone, it disappears. Well, Who paid the that's, taxes? that's been an issue in a number of yeah. real properties. Life. Who paid the delinquent taxes at our, the last Mr. meeting? Mr. Stell has paid the taxes in 2009, 2010. Uh, the last time I checked, two or three weeks ago, the 2011 taxes had not been paid yet. So maybe and I'm not being facetious, sure. but why wouldn't, the, why couldn't the city offer Mr. Tenney, who is the owner by title, $15,001, then they have that city lot because he only owes Mr. Stell $15,000. So you give Mr. Tenney $1 more, well, get rid of the building, you have the lot. You can put parking there for city employees or, or whatever you want to put there. 
why why can you do that that doesn't get your building down well, I, you couldn't put anything there, a parking lot or anything, until you took the building down. And it would cost us $20,000 to take the building down. Now we've got $35,000. $35, but you just there. said that 80% of the asbestos has already been taken out of there I, illegally. The gentleman that uh, Mr. Tenney was going to contract with to take the asbestos out of there uh, after Mr. Tenney had removed some of it, wanted fifteen thousand dollars to remove the rest of the asbestos and i was not to raise i was just the just to remove the rest of the asbestos there's evidently a lot of asbestos in that building then. well there's it depends on how much it costs to get rid of this type and how much it costs to get rid of that type i'll, I'll just have one more question i'm, I'm finished okay. with this one more will you give us a time frame that you all will do something if Mr. Tenney does not have the building down. I don't think we can do that because we. What would we do? There, we'll. Uh, thank you. I, I mean, I do not thank believe you. we can give you a time frame. Well, I, with I'm, a specific action item, we can say June first, but I cannot. There's nobody on this council that can say what the deliverable will be on June first if there's no action by Mr. Tenney. It's impossible. Let's put it. Let's put it on the agenda. For the next council meeting, which is in what three weeks? Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Let's put this back on the agenda. We'll have a lot more information by then, and I think hopefully we can come up with a definitive plan with a timetable. I think two and a half, three weeks is going to make a big difference from what Richard Kenny is saying in regard to Mr. Tenney. If you'd like uh, to pay for, I can order another uh, estimate of how much it would cost to remove what's left. From the house. What, what, what would that be, uh, Rich? Three, four hundred dollars. I think we should do that. I mean, that would give us more information. Because we, I, I'm not going in there. Um, the roof has asbestos in it. The ceiling tiles have asbestos in it. Part of the problem now is cleaning up the area to remove any uh, particles. The uh, State asbestos inspector or state regulators were there and you know said significant amounts have been removed, but you know, I've heard eighty percent, but I don't know that's I true or not. And I'd, I don't know, I don't have a dollar figure. I'd out. make a motion that we ask for another estimate of what to be it's going to be three or four hundred dollars. I think in good faith we ought to do that. Dave, let's um, I would certainly entertain your motion and a second, but I would like to make a comment. Sure. I, I don't want to do that if Cracker Tenney has his license and he's going to proceed. That's true. That's understood, yeah. If he's not in class, we'll pick him up and bring him back before the judge Friday. That's correct. And that's and that's what we can do today. Yeah. No. You're not saying Friday. no we're not? Not Friday because he's the class may end tomorrow. I'm saying if he's not in the class, when you call tomorrow, oh. if he's not in the class, then we issue a warrant and pick him up and he's patrolling about our, our manual by next week. And I think at that point in time, we also ought to say that we're going to get another estimate to see what it costs to get it removed. I mean, let's, let's, get, let's get the Something process concurrently so that we don't sit around here and talk about this for a couple of yeah, It didn't take a lot of phone calls. I, I did have another gentleman take a, a, another look at it just, and he called me back and said that he could get the rest of it out of there for $13,000. <laughs> so. Maybe it wasn't 80%. Yeah, or, maybe it wasn't 80%. Or he got the easy stuff out. Yeah. And another thing that we run into as a city, if David owns that building, or Scott owns that building, or I own this building, and we talk to this guy that Rich is talking about, the price might be $5,000. But every time we ask somebody to do something for the city, the price skyrockets. Yeah. And it seems to. we don't know how to deal with that. I mean, it's not right for that to happen, but that's that's what happened. When we were trying to buy property put the fire station, move the fire station. Every time we asked someone about their property, it was like three or four times what they were asking everybody else. So that's why we went to the auction process and bought the property that the fire station's on now. That was the most fairest way to spend the people's money. But that's what we run into all the time when we're trying to do something within the city is they jack the price up because we think, think our pockets are doing. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I have a motion from Dave to uh, have a, another asbestos inspection done. Is there a second? 
Second. Motion is made and seconded. And, and I said we make that subject to what we find out about Mr. Tenney. If he's that, getting that, his license, we're not going to do this. That's correct. We right. understand this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions so the motion, on the motion? The motion will reflect that. Motion should reflect that. I agree. Yes. Okay. Then the motion is amended. And uh, we're ready for the question. All in favor signify so and saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And it's on the agenda for. And it'll be on the agenda for next meeting. Three weeks. Department Board reports. Michael Doss, we've asked him to report every meeting and all the other supervisors and department heads go every other uh, meeting. And Michael, do you have anything you want to kick in? Or you know? I, I normally don't mind reporting uh, uh, both meetings, but for tonight, I, I'm still in the process of reconciling our monthly bank statements. So I'll have a financial report and actually quite a bit of other information for you for the 24th meeting. Great. So, okay. Mitch, RT. <clears throat> I have just a few quick items. Uh, number one reported uh, last council meeting, maybe one before that, we were having some trouble getting our breathing apparatus tested due to uh, new equipment and a whole facade of things. I think we have the bugs worked out that we're starting to get caught up. Uh, this past week, the guys have made uh, great progress on we got the bugs work out of our testing system out of our software uh, we've made contact with the uh, gentleman from MSA who has helped us a little bit too so I think we're making leaps and bounds on that uh, some of the new equipment that we had ordered that we had budgeted money for in our capital outlay for purchase of equipment for our ladder truck has been ordered has arrived and has been placed in service on the ladder truck <coughs> And uh, we're still working on some radios, waiting for the technician to come and do a few things. And pretty much we're starting moving now to the uh, strawberry festival mode. So that's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, I just want one thing. I guess it is approved. We discussed at the meeting for the closure of Florida Street on Friday night for the farmers' parade. Is that something that we're going to do? We were forced to do that last year due to the emergency event. Our, there we had parked last year our barricade company so we may this year be using part of main street due to the fact that the festival has had to move some of their stuff that way they've kind of given us some area to park up there for fire trucks and also to help them kind of control their flow of traffic and we're thinking in doing that if that's going to be the case to come out and come down florida street we had we had we had it closed last year we didn't do it officially but I think we've discussed that in meetings previous this year, but I don't know if we've done it officially or if that's something we need to do officially or can we just put some barricades up and <coughs> close your room, so. Any questions for Mitch? What about the, let's, uh, I'd entertain a motion we authorize him to close South Florida Street from um, Maine to- uh, We go down to East Victoria. Oh, I'm sorry, Lincoln. To East Lincoln. Yeah. So that's on what? That's on, <laughs> that's on uh, Friday night following the uh, fireman's prayer. This has just kind of came to light for us after a meeting uh, last week with the Strawberry Festival and some of our planning that we're doing with them. Uh, they have decided to move their stage from here to another area and that, <coughs> that parking. And then the issue came up well, if we don't have a barricade there, how to control the people and how to keep traffic out of it on Friday night, I thought was a uh, if the fire, the fire departments can park fire trucks there, we'll kill two birds with one stone. So that's an option we're looking at. So, so we'll, we'll give him a minute. Okay. Everybody make a motion to uh, approve that. Motion's made there a second. Seven. And seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. And Mitch, if you don't need it, you don't need it. Um, Marty? Uh, yeah. Just, you, weren't, you weren't signed in, but do you, do you well, want I got I couldn't find my truck keys. Okay. <laughs> you want to? You have anything on addressing with? Or? Well, I got my permit or stuff back from uh, the inspection. There is no asbestos in anything. It comes zero for everything. Uh, what I want to know is, can I put a, or a mobile or a modular in over there now? So as I take a look at your permit you brought in today and have Jay look at it, we'll have an answer for you very shortly. Okay, okay. now the next question. Does the board have a bite or does uh, any bite when he tells you he's going to throw you in jail if you don't have the house tore down two weeks then says you can't tear it down because of asbestos there is none 
two weeks. Yep, that's what you told me. Six months. No, you told me two weeks. That's what you told me. Raymond Hall was sitting right there with me. When, and uh, another thing, when's a man's ward not good enough? I told you there's no asbestos in there. I built it myself. Well, I understand. Well, I, I was growing up to that's, that's that not you, the, your man's uh, ward was his ward. I don't think this is the point to discuss this, but uh, if you check with state law, and I'll yield to my <clears throat> asbestos uh, superstar back here, Jay. You want to? <laughs> yes, state law does require every structure, be it a, a remodel or um, a, a renovation, tear down, add on, that has to be inspected for uh, as asbestos. It, it does have to be inspected for asbestos, and uh, you, and that's why we have those requirements uh, in in our permitting, uh, you know, application. Okay, now the next question. I just had to have my lot resurveyed because when the city put their sewer line out front, they took my two corner posts out. And, and are you guys gonna kick a little in on that? You guys are uh, the corner our, post our, is not supposed to be moved. Talk to the utility boys. Yeah, you have to talk to the sanitary board and the, and the sewer department. Marty, I can't speak to that here. Yeah. They they control that. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Now you're not going to prove my house, are you? No, not tonight. Yeah, not not tonight. tonight. You'll get your house. Yeah. No, it ain't. Yeah, you get your he house. He got something against me. I know it. No, I don't think so. I live in the poor, poor section of the town. <laughs> okay. Um, Jay Hall, city engineer. Um, just a couple, three projects really to highlight, and then I'm not going to bore you with all the other stuff that I'm doing. But it's good. <laughs> uh, got to talk with the uh, DOH in Charleston on Tuesday. Uh, the Gateway East project has uh, passed and been approved by the historical office. So uh, we, we can proceed with that. It's now been moved up to engineering. Um, Mark was stating that uh, he expects approval from engineering and issuing the city of Buchanan a notice to proceed no later than the mid of June. So, so that's a good thing because uh, we had a meeting today and with the department's head from uh, water and sewer, we've got some small things that need to be corrected and some water meters moved to the back side of the new curb location before Jerry can start the project. So while that's happening, you know, we're still going to be waiting for approval on Gateway East. So hopefully no more than a, a July 1 or July 2nd start on, on those projects. Um, Water treatment plan got an executed document back from Allegheny Restoration stating that they agree that the project was completed uh, in the way that it was designed and they uh, are happy with what they have done. The clock starts for them as far as warranty periods and that they're going to come back one month before those deadlines are up both in one and five years and make sure that their <coughs> remediation are still holding and if um, they, they're not, which we hope that's not the case, they'll make those repairs free of charge. And last but not least, the Army National Guard. That's been my hang-up. Uh, it was the first project I started, and it's probably one of the last to reach this stage. Finally got that gas line located via a detail locate where they went out with the backhoes and shovels and ex physically exposed the line in numerous locations. We located those via GPS. And we're actually able to finish my layout design. And what that leads to is now I'm at have finished with the uh, right-of-way agreements to put a water line through the nine different parcels of property that are going to involved with this project and uh, Dave and I are still reviewing the right-of-ways and you know as soon as we're done with that we want to mail those out and get an executed document so that we can proceed with the projects um, we fixed a nice little water leak over here on Island Avenue last Tuesday after the big snow it's funny to say that at the end of April mid first of May but um, you know, a uh, two-inch line had broken and uh, was putting out about 75 gallons a minute. That's a small number, but when you compare it per day, it's about 110,000 gallons a day. And uh, the guys, you know, knew they had to get in because we were just losing water, losing water, but they did a great job of, of fixing it on Tuesday. And, you know, out there in TV land, I'd like to thank the DOH for their cooperation on that project, providing us with uh, flagging. Uh, barricade and also assisting in the repair because they also had some repairs that they needed to make at that intersection. And if you don't have any questions, I mean, you know, there's other projects going on, but you know, they're just in the design stage. Any other questions for Jay? Thank you, Jay. Mayor, could I redress council? I forgot yeah. one important thing. Uh, last week, or maybe first part of this week, there was an article in a record delta uh, from the OEM from the 
Upshur County OEM office that the city of Buchanan did not have an emergency operations plan that was in conjunction with the OEM office. On September the 21st of 2006, the city of Buchanan adopted resolution number 2006-15 that basically stated the city of Buchanan would adopt and recognize the emergency operation plan that was presented by the uh, Upshur County Office of Emergency Service slash Upshur County Commission. There is supposed to be, as I gather, a record of that on file to courthouse. I can't attest to that. I want to make Major sure. steal on my thunder. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you want me to sit down and shut up now? Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, 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 I would you, like, you have more on that than I do. I would <laughs> like to speak about this. You go ahead. Um, but I'll do it at my time, okay? Right. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's okay. We'll, uh, for, we'll forgive you. Jerry. Uh, well, I'm <laughs> Just don't say anything the mayor wants to say. <laughs> <laughs> Consolidated Public Works Board's report. Uh, Consolidated Board met April 26th. Uh, under new business, we uh, discussed parking at Jawbone. The portion that opened, we put a couple of, uh, well, actually four, to our parking signs in that portion of the lot for now, just to regulate uh, some of the parking down there. We also discussed uh, other method methods and are looking at other methods of uh, regulating parking in that lot. Uh, I have brought to the board uh, asked for direction on how the farmer's market was to operate with an operational schedule. And we discussed several different options, but the board felt the council needs to meet the farmer's market representatives and uh, include the community. The board approved a request to have a yoga class at the Walk Trail on June 21st. Treasurer Dolph reported that Ryan Rexford, the criminal justice major from <coughs> Weston College, will work temporarily during the summer to fill the parking enforcement position, and this subject will be, need to be addressed again before uh, August. Ambie had presented the information uh, as a matter of record for uh, the Martino lot not being available to us anymore for parking. Under storm drains, uh, engineer Sam Ludlow reported the work on the phase of Ritchie Street project is nearly complete. And under comments, I reported on the uh, meeting with the Strawberry Festival, and there is a map available for your review of uh, the carnival setup and the vendor setup. Also, the Trump Salon had asked uh, to purchase some hanging baskets and for them to be placed until Bob has his flowers up on the light post but asked that we water them and consolidated uh, approved Bob to go ahead and take care of them. Uh, under waste board we met this evening and Michael Balls presented a draft of next year's budget which the board will review and take up the next meeting. Approved the purchase of a used 2006 Kenworth uh, tractor from Worldwide Equipment for $68,500. And um, in the auction, we, we held the equipment auction again at the transfer station last Friday. And the waste collection sold the uh, recycling pickup. Uh, we did, as you recall, we had a grant to replace that truck with. Uh, sold the recycling pickup for $1,200, and we had the cabin chassis from a, a garbage truck that sold for $700. Transfer station report, we had 1,724 transactions and 1,170.44 tons. And uh, the grand total of monies was $96,794.14. And in recycling, we did 52.27 tons. Operation in the uh, department was normal for the month. And that's all I have unless there's questions. Jerry. Thank you, Terry. <clears throat> Rich Clemens, zoning officer. Uh, just a couple of items. Uh, one, uh, there's a uh, note in your packet. Uh, we received <coughs> word this week that the second um, historic district for Buchanan has been approved. Uh, this is a project that I've been uh, working on along with the members of the uh, historic landmark 
commission for about two years. The consultant came in and took our work and wrote up the actual uh, submission to the uh, keeper of the National Register, and that was approved. Um, so the homes in the what's called the Buchanan Central Residential Historic District, which is roughly bounded by College Avenue, South Kanawha, Madison Street, and uh, portions of East Main Street, including a section up towards uh, City Hall, uh, are now listed on the National Register. That does not make any requirements of those properties, but it does provide some options for those folks to obtain uh, grants from both the state and the federal uh, agencies to help uh, maintain those properties, particularly the exterior of those properties, uh, and keeping them uh, in their historical uh, configuration and so on. So it's, it's been quite a uh, chore. We're glad to see it happen. And uh, we'll be having more information and contact those individual property owners uh, of information that might be valuable to them that, that have that designation now. That does include the Latham House, uh, so it's now on the uh, National Register. Also note that uh, in connection with the farmer's market that uh, Beth Long called me the other day. She apparently has the results of the survey that they took last year uh, and plans to have that to me so hopefully early next week. Uh, so they have them tallied and, and ready to submit them. And, uh, she's been helpful calling uh, about every couple of weeks and bringing me up to date on issues regarding the farmers market and some of the feedback and checking on information as to where we stand as well so uh, just let you have that information that's all I have question for rich Dave McCall City Attorney. thank you mayor <clears throat> several updates uh, first off you have a draft ordinance it's not a first reading just a draft ordinance that uh, depending upon how you all react to this between now and three weeks from now, we might entertain as a first reading either at your last meeting in May or the first meeting in June. This was uh, tailored in no small part after the recently adopted uh, City of Charleston ordinance that uh, Mr. Doss uh, forwarded to me a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I, what I'd like to do is just point out a few things about this and then have you all study it uh, between now and the 24th. Um, but if you go over to Article 3, which is where we get into the real uh, teeth of the ordinance, uh, just let me read through a, a couple of sections. Prohibited activities and exemptions. Noise prohibited generally. Subject to the exceptions contained herein, no person shall make, continue, or cause to be made any noise as prohibited herein or alternatively make, continue, or cause to be made any noise exceeding the limitations established herein. So what's prohibited under A? Noise prohibited motor vehicles, motorcycles, motor boats. All motor vehicles, motorcycles, and motor boats shall be operated as quietly as possible at all times within the city. No person shall operate any motor vehicle, motorcycle, or motor boat in such a manner so as to cause unnecessary noise within the city. Two, no person <coughs> operating or occupying a motor vehicle on a street or highway shall amplify from within the motor vehicle the sound produced by radio, tape player or other mechanical sound making device or instrument used for entertainment so that the sound is plainly audible at a distance of 25 feet or more from the motor vehicle. Three, no person shall remove or render inoperative or cause to be removed or rendered inoperative other than for purposes of maintenance, repair, or replacement any muffler or sound dissipative device on a motor vehicle, motorcycle, or motorboat operated within the city. I think that's dissipative. I apologize for my mispronunciation. Four, no person shall operate or permit the operation within the city of any motor vehicle, motorcycle, or motor boat without factory installed mufflers or their equivalent, provided that if no factory installed or equivalent muffler was present at the time of manufacture of the motor vehicle, motorcycle, or motor boat, then sound emanating from the motor vehicle, motorcycle, or motor boat shall be effectively muffled in a reasonable manner by equipment so constructed and used to muffle sound. Five, no person shall use a muffler cutout, 
bypass or similar device upon a motor vehicle or motorcycle operated within the city. Six, no person in actual physical control of a motor vehicle within the city shall use a dynamic braking system unless said use is necessary to prevent or avoid an accident that may cause property damage, injury, or loss of life. This provision shall not apply to fire trucks or other emergency vehicles equipped with a dynamic braking system. If you go back to the definition section in Article 2, we're talking about uh, essentially the Jake brake uh, braking method. Now, uh, under dwellings, if you go to page four under B, no person occupying a dwelling within the city shall amplify from within the dwelling the sound produced by radio, tape player, television, or other mechanical sound making device or instrument used for the purposes of entertainment so that the sound is plainly audible at a distance of 25 feet or more from the dwelling. Uh, back under the definition section, there's further language that talks about uh, certain things relative to uh, people using uh, the leaf blowers and those kinds of things. So if you follow into C, which is exemptions, folks are, somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago, are they gonna make uh, Wesleyan turn the chimes off at the college? Uh, no. Uh, the following are exempt from the provisions of this section. A, noise resulting from emergency or necessary maintenance work as performed by the city of Buchanan the state of West Virginia or the United States of America or any of their political subdivisions or public utility companies, including but not limited to any work of any kind on roads, streets, bridges, alleys, rights of way or government owned property. B, noise resulting from any emergency vehicle when responding to an emergency call or acting in time of emergency or during training exercises and maintenance. C, noise from emergency signaling devices. D, noise from a burglar or fire alarm installed on any building, motor vehicle, or other property, so long as the alarm terminates its operation within five minutes of its activation, provided that it shall be deemed reasonable for an activated alarm to continue to operate if a crime or fire is in progress at or near the property and or until law enforcement or other emergency personnel have responded to a legitimate call for assistance related in any way to the property at which the activated alarm is located. E, noise from domestic power tools, landscaping, and yard maintenance equipment, and agricultural equipment when operated between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. on weekdays, and between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. on weekends and legal holidays. F, noise from commercial or industrial power tools, landscaping and yard maintenance equipment and agricultural equipment on a residential property or within 250 feet of a residential property line when operated on commercial or industrial property, again between the hours of 7 and 9 on weekdays and 8 and 9 on weekends <coughs> and holidays. G, noise from church or chapel bells and chimes when used as part of a religious observance or service or for national celebrations or public holidays and those bells and chimes that are presently installed and in use, provided said use is reasonable and for a church or West Virginia Wesleyan College related purpose. H, noise generated during the normal course of business by any properly licensed commercial or industrial enterprise operating lawfully within an area properly zoned for said enterprise unless or until said lawful business use is deemed abandoned as a matter of law or fact pursuant to any other city ordinance. I, Noise from construction, drilling, earth moving, excavating, or demolition activity, provided all motorized equipment used in such activity is equipped with functioning mufflers. J, noise from snow blowers, snow throwers, and snow plows when operated with a muffler for the purpose of snow removal. K, noise generated in situations within the jurisdiction of the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration. L, noise generated from city-sponsored or approved celebrations or events, including but not limited to parades, outdoor concerts, festivals, and athletic events. M, noise generated from any secondary school and higher education-sponsored or approved celebrations or events, including but not limited to outdoor concerts or band festivals and outdoor athletic events and practices. N, noise produced by governmental body or employee thereof in the performance of any governmental function. O, noise generated from athletic events or practices. P, noise generated from airplanes or other piloted vehicles arriving to or departing from the Buchanan-Upshur Airport. Q, 
noise generated from railroads within the city. R, noise generated from events at the city's public safety complex or Stockard Youth Center. S, noise generated from fireworks authorized by the city. T, noise generated from events promoted by the Buchanan Convention and Visitors Bureau. And U, noise generated from events promoted by West Virginia Wesleyan College, meaning on the campus of West Virginia Wesleyan College. Under the enforcement section, if you'll go over with me to page eight, um, this is a progressive kind of a penalty. The uh, city of Charleston has not uh, involved any jail time on any of these offenses. Rather, it's a progressive financial kind of a thing. $100 for a first offense. Uh, if you repeat it within the 24 month period, it would be regarded as a second offense. And you're fine would go from $100 to $200 for a second offense. $300 for a third offense, $400 for a fourth offense, and $500 for a fifth and each subsequent offense occurring within any 24-month period. Uh, the severability article is our standard <coughs> we stick in all of our ordinances. And the effective date, um, I'm just guessing that we might read this on a first reading at the May 24th uh, meeting. Second reading would be at your first meeting in June, which is June 7, and it would become operative on July 7 of 2012. So there's some things in there for you all to look at, kind of a homework assignment, if you will, see what you like and don't like about it. There's, this is just, uh, it's, it's probably 80% modeled after a Charleston's ordinance. And of course, the things that are not applicable here, I took out. There are some things that we needed to interject that weren't applicable in Charleston. So you know, look at it and, and uh, let's be prepared to maybe discuss it at the May 24th meeting. That's all I have on that one, unless you have any questions about this draft. I have a couple other things to report about. You listed in here, uh, Wesleyan College, the church bell. Yes. I don't see the courthouse. Courthouse clock dings, how, where would it fall in? Or does it, or does it need to be listed separately? We, well, any governmental function that right. creates noise is exempt, but we could we could add the uh, Because the I think if you're gonna courthouse. name names, as time progresses, you're going to have to add more names. Because other churches are going to ring bells and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> sure. Any, any church is okay. Any governmental function is okay. The reason Wesleyan was put in there is it's neither government nor technically a church, although you could say the chapel was a church, I suppose. But, yeah. Um, well, can up to your regional airport. You want international regional airport? No, it's <laughs> regional. <laughs> okay. We'll get that title right next week. But that's one of these things I'm asking for. This uh, exemptions on the uh, fire truck, emergency vehicles, dynamic braking should include school buses. We can do that too. Because there's some of those do have transmission brakes on them. Sure. Those are the kinds of things that I'm yeah. looking for, for some guidance and, you know, it's not the uh, Macaulay ordinance, it's yeah. what you guys want to put in there. Is, Absolutely. Is 25 feet practical data? That's only about eight yards. Well, there are different ways of monitoring the noise of stuff. Uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Doss and I were talking about before the meeting, uh, do we go ahead and invoke the uh, decibel levels that uh, the federal guidelines uh, set forth, which is about 80 decibels when the gun is directed at the noise source from a certain distance, which I think is 25 feet. Um, the way this ordinance reads right now and the way Charleston has done it, Apparently, they're not uh, using as their primary means of detection as to whether there is excessive noise uh, using the decibel guns. Other municipalities have very closely regimented, uh, you know, here's, here's the level for certain activities. And uh, it would vary from activity to activity. And if it exceeds that, then you have a finable situation. So that's, that's something else that we need to consider. Uh, do you want to just go with the vaguer language that Charleston is using? Or do we want to implement what some municipalities do outside of West Virginia, which ties things in very closely with the decimal gun? That's not to say you couldn't use the decimal gun for prima facie proof that someone has uh, is, is doing something in an excessive noise way, uh, but we haven't put that formula in this ordinance, saying here's the decibel amount that will be conclusive that you have violated our noise ordinance. Was that what you well, in a way, at first I'm disappointed you didn't get the Z. To Z? I'm sorry. <laughs> we were all thinking we that. We got school buses now. We got one to us. We were all thinking that. Uh, I actually have some experience with this. Uh, when I was in Indiana, uh, there's a place uh, called Elkhart, Indiana, 
which has a noise ordinance which actually Charleston modeled after and they go and, and place uh, DBA levels adds a lot more enforceability and credibility to the police enforcing that with their gun I stand 25 feet and clocked it at 80 DBA and there that's a violation of um, it just is like speeding tickets or something like that and having that evidence there I mean we have the gun so we have the, the mechanism to enforce that but I, I'd like to work with Dave and uh, and uh, Matt on this as well since I mean I, I kind of have some experience in this myself and Ms. Valley I worked in so. you wait Mr. McCoy answered my question I was thinking about the church bell at Holy Rosary Church okay. and it, it would be exempt Marty well but it's hard to hear people's got her TV up don't realize it <laughs> Somebody might knock on your door. Well, they haven't knocked yet, but my <laughs> daughter comes in and she says, Are you deaf? And I go, Yeah. That must be. My wife says the same thing to me. Jay? Yeah, I just want to make a clarification to a statement that I made earlier. Uh, it, it's in regards to Mr. Hans, and I want to clarify what happened with the, with the cease and desist order. I, I, you know, I just pulled up uh, the state requirements. And when you came in last week and visited with us, it was going to be a remodel, you know, mm -hmm. and so there was no asbestos required. But when you decided to demo demo the structure or raise it, what? you know, it well, I was told I had to raise it 24 more inches. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you do that without tearing it down? Well, you know, there there are jacks, but prior. No, you know, we tried that once before. We the, about got killed in that one. <laughs> the state code says prior to any demolition an asbestos survey must be conducted and that was the reason why when you went from a remodel to a, a raising of the building with a Z not the I-A-S-I-N-G <laughs> but uh, that's what prompted the cease and desist because when you went from just a simple remodel to a raising or demoing of the building that would, that prompted or you know instigated the uh, you gave me two more hours we done. <laughs> I just wanted to make that clear that it's a demo when okay. you demo a structure you must have an asbestos uh, survey and while we're in a, a uh, position talking about your permit, let me add too that uh, yeah, I jump on your permit a little faster, but I jumped on the first one, and then we had a second one, and I'm, then we I'm had a third this one. Time. I'm done this time. Oh, okay, well that's why I, I was kind of I, 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 I was kind of waiting for another one tomorrow, and uh, I wouldn't have to do that. Don't, don't, I, I don't. I can't get the modular until uh, middle of June or the first of June. So oh, you I got plenty of time. time. Yeah, you got all kinds of time. <laughs> I didn't do anything else. Yes. Hey, I would like you to come over and make sure on the front. Don't worry. Because be the ready. houses aren't quite all lined up, and I want to see which one you want me to pick. <laughs> let's, let's get back to it. Yeah. I was going to recommend that Mr. Clemens be nominated as the noise enforcement officer. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the, uh, all right. All right. <laughs> Monday night, uh, there was a hearing before the uh, Buchanan Police Civil Service Commission. Uh, Officer Mark Stewart, who had tested for the position of sergeant uh, earlier in the month, had uh, contended and filed his written grievance as is permitted by state statute, objecting to uh, the testing method that the city had utilized. The uh, commission, after hearing from uh, Officer Stewart and also from me, uh, and it's their unilateral opportunity to, to determine this, uh, the commission decided that they would extend Officer Stewart the opportunity to be retested. Um, the procedure that's going to be followed in the future will result in the study guides that the test manufacturer makes, uh, procuring those for whichever officer is seated for the promotional test, given a 60-day period of time after those materials are given before the test would be administered, and uh, that's the policy that uh, they have adopted and will utilize in the future relative to testing. Or promotional situations. So I wanted to report that to the council. Um, <clears throat> I've been working with Mr. Holland a bit on the Brushy Fork uh, annexation to help facilitate the realization of the new armory project. Mr. Himes is doing his title work on the Route 20 annexation, updating the materials that we need to have done out there. I have received the uh, pump station uh, description of survey above Lowe's haven't had the opportunity yet to draft the deed or to talk with Mr. Rexford about executing it, but that's in the works. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Smith, I believe we'll have to us next week all of the First Community Bank uh, descriptions so that we can affect that long uh, awaited project. Um, I've already mentioned tonight that I've begun drafting the vacant building ordinance for your consideration, and we still haven't closed on the progressive bank swap 
but uh, everything is ready to go, and I hope that we can do that next week if the mayor is available to sign the city did. That's all I have, unless you have questions for me. <clears throat> do we really need to go to uh, executive session for Beach Street? Yes. Okay. All right. Good enough. Um, brings us down into our correspondence. Um, we took care of D2 and D3. D1 is Upshur County EMS requests to use a golf cart running around the streets during the West Virginia Strawberry Festival, and we have typically authorized them to do so to entertain a motion to approve that request. So moved. So moved. Second. Motion made to second. Any discussion? Question. All in favor say aye. Rich, I'm sorry. Do you have a correspondence from um, Steve Foster that I gave you? Yes. Well, yeah, it's, it was uh, given to uh, Mitch and, and uh, Matt. Okay. I didn't put it in the agenda tonight because, I mean, we can talk about it. I'm going to ask him here just now. <laughs> Sorry. He's, I was he's sitting there looking, looking at him. Yeah. Uh, he's trying to get out of here. So uh, did I hear a motion and a second on the, on the golf cart before? Yes. You did. And did we vote? No. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Consent agenda is the minutes of the regular meeting of April 19th, building and wiring permits and the payment of the bills, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So and and second with All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Um, Consolidated Public Works Board recommendation removal parking on Lemon Street. Did anyone get a chance to go out there and take a look at that. I know I did. I know Skeeter did. Did anybody? I did. I did. I went out there and saw it. Okay. And, uh, park there. Skeeter made it what I think is a, a suggestion that would solve this problem for us and for the people on the street there. Jared, I didn't get a chance to talk to you about this. Skeeter suggested we put parking, no parking from here to the corner, 30 feet back from the upper end of that street. Uh, allow your truck to garbage trucks to turn in there. I would have to measure, Skeeter. My understanding now, that's the problem. Is is it's not we're not getting a complaint from the uh, the actual truck on the street where our trucks are going over and, and getting into the yard of the neighbor uh, across from the truck. Um, I'll go up and, and measure that street, but it's going to be really tight to get a, a garbage truck. We back up because it's difficult to stay. That's the other thing I was going to ask is why, why couldn't this back up with on the street? There's only two houses there. Uh, or they make that turn at the top. Well, we, that's what we do. We back up Lemon Street. And that truck is, is uh, down from the corner at times. And we have to get over in the yard. That's where the complaint was coming from. <coughs> the initial complaint came from. And then uh, we had, uh, in the winter, one of the plow trucks actually run off the street into the yard. Uh, you know, like I said, I can take a look and see if there's some way that we can uh, <coughs> maybe, limit, maybe limit parking the day that our trucks are in there, but you're still going to have issues with plow trucks in the winter. The original complaint was an individual could not get out of his driveway because of a vehicle parked across. Uh, and then that individual accommodated them by moving where they were parking, and that created a problem with the city trucks. So it's kind of, you know, if you fix one problem, you may end up generating another. I don't know. I, you know I, might I, be a good suggestion. Just to look at it that way. I think we're so, still not ready to vote on this. Bring it back next meeting. Yeah, we'll bring it back another meeting. So the the, the the residents are complaining or a property owner property owner that we uh, actually tracked into their yard skeeter because the complaint one of the complaints i got was from us tracking in their yard that's what i was trying to figure out where it all stemmed from to see how we can resolve what, what part of it we need to resolve for it. like i said let me take another look at it because that is been <coughs> yes sir yeah. Okay, we'll get some more information. We'll take care of this another day. Yeah, Brings us comments and announcements. Michael, you finished? I'm finished. Scott, your turn. Um, the only thing I have to say is this Tucker Street thing is just ugly. Fair. And the sad thing is we don't have a lot of stroke. We have brought what we can to bear on this situation. 
and it is unfortunate for the residents. They have legal course, but they would have no fuller basket than we would have right now. You know, and I wish we could have an immediate fix for these things. It's just not going to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm remiss. I'm sorry Rick ran out when I said we can't really put a deadline to this, and I don't think we really can. There's not a deliverable that we can guarantee by any date in June 15th or May 2nd or whatever. Um, we're bringing everything we can to bear on the situation, and it's just one of these ugly things that uh, we have to contend with, and I'm sorry for the neighbors that have to put up with this. And we will continue to bring to bear what we can on the situation. Is it? Skeeter? I'm too sure the same frustration, Tucker Street. <clears throat> but I'm afraid we're sending a message to folks that you could not take care of your property and get away with it. And, and we don't want to do that. Um, I too don't know what the answer is. I've met with Rick and, uh, and Mrs. Painter there, McConney, uh, a couple times uh, down there at that location. Uh, I guess the painters are the ones that suffer the most because that property is right on them. Uh, the quicker we can resolve this, the better it's going to be for everybody. And it is, it's just gone too long. Yeah. Also met with Mr. Himes today. Uh, I didn't know he was coming tonight. I was going to represent him tonight and have my time to speak, but he's already spoke, so uh, I don't have anything else. Steve. <laughs> I had uh, drafted a letter. Three times I've looked over there seeing I'm going to call him Steve. <laughs> Can, you, can we hang on a minute while I change tapes? Yeah, go ahead. I like to know. We're not. I suggest we bring that guy in from the EPA. We're on. And let, let him be the enforcement yeah. officer. Stay <laughs> here on. Okay. Um, as Mr. Alexander mentioned earlier, on July 19th, we're going to have the fifth oil and gas show here in, in Buchanan. And what I'd like to ask for your consideration is that we could close Camden Avenue from Braxton Street, which is just past the new dorm all the way to Brook Street on both sides and then on the other side of the street on one side go all the way on Cannon up to possibly the railroad yard and the reason for that is, is a lot of that equipment brought in is very heavy okay and it's difficult to get it in behind the dormitories and the other issue is if we have a continuous heat wave like we're currently having that asphalt's going to get chewed up pretty well by some of that heavy equipment whereas concrete would fare a lot better. If you could have everything there on that stretch of Camden Avenue, it would be a lot easier to pull in, drop the heavy equipment, and go on out. There'd still be room for emergency vehicles to get around behind the dorms and, and back out on Brook Street. So, I don't know if that's Ioga's first priority or not, but that is an option they asked me to pursue. So, it may need to take till next week to get Matt's input and other people's input, but I'm just here to ask you, answer any questions you might have about that. I gave copies of your request to Mitch and to Matt uh, with a question mark on it to get back to me. They haven't talked to either one of them since okay. I did that, but uh, certainly I'll try to respond and I think the consul would be agreeable if they're agreeable. Well, if you'll just let me know what your decision is after their input, then I can let Ioga know and they can go ahead and plan accordingly. Uh, they are expecting a rather larger turnout this year. Um, they've got more booth space in the gymnasium. Um, they've got invitations out and I believe initial acceptances from Senator Manchin, from the governor. Um, there's going to be about three to 400 people there at least that, that particular day. Um, depending on the elections, uh, we want the mayor there. And uh, the council was also invited just also the night before the Iowa uh, puts a little get together on it, a uh, bicentennial, and we'd like to have you folks involved with that as well. Do you need to know before our next meeting on the 24th? No, that'll be okay. But they'll be putting out spaces and lining everything up relative to equipment. So if you can let me know on the 24th, that'll be fine. Did we close in the avenue for one house for this? Yeah. Yep. We, we yeah. closed one side of it. One side of it. Not, not both sides. I don't remember that. Yeah. 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 I remember. I remember. We closed one side of it. That was when it was in the horseshoe. Right. They had the horseshoe. Some of they were having trouble turning the trucks or something. Right. So they needed one side of the road. It's a bear getting them in out there. And Jerry and I had figured out how they could go in there and turn around and, and head everybody out. And they pulled in the wrong way. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, Thank truck drivers don't know anything any better. I know. I know some truck drivers and some former truck drivers that don't have any sense at all. That's right. right. <laughs> if it's smaller than us, we run over. Yeah. <laughs> Rich Clemens. Uh, just uh, a couple of comments. Uh, the Festival Fridays is uh, getting organized. Uh, there's some folks volunteering. We've had some volunteers. Uh, what really impressed me was some of them from the uh, high school came in, helped paint uh, some of the structures down in the farmer's market drawbone area, and they even saw them the other day on uh, Main Street. So uh, trying to get the town spruced up. Hope everybody uh, gets ready for the Strawberry Festival and uh, enjoys it. I must also say that uh, the community lost a, a dear friend this uh, past week or so, and uh, Tom Dunn. And, uh, it's really when uh, you step back and think of all he's done for this community, it's uh, quite a loss for our, for our area. That's all I have. Okay. John? Oh, Steve took my time. He took your time. Okay. Pam? I just had to giggle a little bit when Steve made the comment about depending on the elections. Well, no matter how that turns out, nobody takes office to July 1st. So that's right. I guess we're all invited. <laughs> so, but but it's Ju July, the, July, July the 19th. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but um, I just want to ask everybody to get out and the vote because if you don't vote, you don't, you don't have a voice. And I uh, also want to remind everybody that... Um, our regular meeting normally is the week of Strawberry Festival on Thursday night, and we have uh, canceled that until the following week, which will be on the 24th. So. Dave? I want to echo um, what Rich said about <clears throat> Mr. Dunn, and uh, condolences to his family. Our thoughts and prayers are with him. Uh, also with Scott and Skeeter, what they said about Tucker Street, I, I still want to focus on what we need to do after Tucker Street, we, we need to try to develop a different process that gives us uh, potential to have more bite, but at the same time be respectful to property owners. Um, and I also ask, uh, as Pam said, go out and vote if you haven't voted. And also um, be careful what you read on the internet. But for those of you that get on Facebook or what have you, um, there's a lot of information out there and sometimes it's not accurate. And I think the city has an open and transparent process. So if you have questions uh, or concerns, you know, call City Hall or call one of the uh, council members and chat with them or all of them. Um, it's good to find out your facts before you put something in writing. So have a nice strawberry festival. <laughs> uh, that makes it my turn. I was going to talk about this article in the newspaper. The OEM city needs an emergency plan. And um, yeah, Amanda uh, Hayes wrote that. Yeah, Amanda wrote that. But then, <laughs> you know, that's fine. But Somebody. it says that the what it would mislead, and and I don't accuse Amanda or or any other uh, of our folks of, of trying to mislead through the newspaper. I think they generally do a very good job of reporting what we what we do, and and sometimes things just get misrepresented a little bit here is the emergency operations plan for Upshur County. Is that Ms. Shelby advised council that the mayor had initially signed off on the plan but felt council needed to formally approve the adoption of the plan and mayor was Jim Knorr. He said the council could opt to create their own plan if they did not want to adopt the county's plan. Chief Gregory said he had reviewed the county plan and did not feel the city should try to develop a city plan, and he recommended the council's approval. Um, Mitch, Stacy, Mitch Tracy Tasty was not at the meeting. It says here that a motion was made by Kenny Davidson and seconded by Keith Queen to adopt Resolution 2006-15 as submitted, and the motion carries. And that that uh, resolution says be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Buchanan hereby approves and agrees to adopt the Upshur County Emergency Operations Plan, which is filed in the Office of the Upshur County Commission at the Courthouse in Buchanan, West Virginia, and a copy is on file at City Hall, 70 East Main Street, Buchanan, West Virginia. This is it, approved at the Council meeting 
on the 21st day of September 2006. So we've not been without, I want everybody to know that the city of Buchanan has not been without an emergency operations plan. Uh, I would uh, further refer to, if, if you think this is unusual for us to buy into what the county is doing, there's a countywide hazard mitigation plan that was written uh, a few years ago, and the uh, I was a member, I was was a county commissioner at that time, and uh, uh, the uh, Homeland Security or the Office of State Office of Emergency Management or whatever uh, provided uh, money to the government entities. They gave the county commission a certain amount of money to do this hazard mitigation plan, and they gave money to the city of Buchanan and city council at that time opted to buy into the county's hazard mitigation plan. What kind of hazards would we experience in this county that would not affect the city of Buckhannon and the city of Buckhannon affect the county? Same way with emergency um, uh, operations. So we've had a plan, we have a plan, we adopted the plan. Let's make it clear uh, that we've not been without one. One other thing I would have to mention, uh, and, and it sounds a little bit defensive, but I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. At the end of the uh, article, it says that uh, Mayor Kenny Davidson was out of the office last week. No explanation. Kenny Davidson was out of the office because he had a double hernia repaired. That's why I'm wearing the suspenders now because I can't pull my belt up tight enough to keep my pants up. And um, so that's why I was out of the office. And uh, I didn't want to make a big issue out of that because a lot of people have had hernias and anyone's had one repaired knows how bothersome they can be. And uh, I'll leave it at that. But uh, I just... Uh, some, sometimes, sometimes certain things um, kind of light like your fire, and my fire was lit, and I had to get it off my chest. Thanks for wearing the suspenders. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm sure that could get ugly. It wouldn't bother me one way or the other. <laughs> Can we adjourn the meeting before it gets any weirder? So we're having fun. Good. Uh, that brings us to um, the. Uh, I would like to call a meeting, a special meeting of the city council. Uh, and, your convenience, whatever you all like, for next week. Festival's coming. After that, we have a council meeting, and the farmer's market operation looms, as Jerry pointed out to us. And uh, we have, in times past, met with a, a group of people who we would call a farmer's market committee and so on, and we come up with some ideas, and then we, we always end up coming here to city council for approval, and that's where I believe we need to come. Council owns the parking lot down there. Council owns the, uh, or the, the city does, and we're their representatives. So I would like to have, uh, if next Wednesday night or next Thursday night works for this council, I'd like to call a meeting at our regular time, a special meeting of the council, so we can act at that council meeting and uh, invite and we'll we'll put out some invitations so the folks who the growers who want to participate in that can come and participate and we need to establish when our operational hours and what our rules are going to be and to uh, to go mill around in this committee and that committee and that committee and then okay we come back to the council we need to have this discussion in front of the council we need to hear what they have to say and and what other people have to say so all interested parties are interested are invited. What evening suits you best? Wednesday? Either one for me. Either, either one. Wednesday or Thursday. I'd rather do Thursday. Rather do Thursday. Either one. Thursday. Okay. Thursday evening, next at uh, 7 p.m., special uh, council meeting uh, to we, consider. We have time to ever talk about all that. Oh, yes. Consider the farmer's market. Okay? That's our sole topic then. That's our sole topic. That's our number one agenda item we will talk about and 
the farmer's market and, and uh, coming up with a plan. Jerry, I hope you can be here. <laughs> Michael, hope you can be here. <laughs> David, hope you can be here. Press, I hope you can be here. I'll be here. <laughs> and uh, uh, that brings us to executive session on the Beach Street property. I would entertain a motion. We enter into executive session. So moved. 698 4 for property. Motion made. Seconded. Seconded. Moved. Vote. Aye. 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 Opposed, no. 